Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning. Um, I'd like to welcome you all um, to this virtual briefing today for Commonwealth clerks and parliamentary staff on delivering uh, parliamentary democracy during the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Jack Cardcastle. Uh, I'm from the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, and I will be facilitating this session uh, for you today. And it's a pleasure to have you all here. This is the first of its kind for the CPA, the first webinar. Um, and under current circumstances, probably the first of many. Um, so I'm glad you can all be, be here for this experience. Um, I'm delighted to say that we're joined by up to 100 um, attendees from across the Commonwealth. Um, and of course, our brilliant um, set of panellists who I will introduce shortly. Um, now, introducing this session, I don't think I need to go into any detail in regards to the impacts that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has had on public health, societal issues, um, but importantly for us today, political institutions as well, and the effective functioning of Parliament. Um, so on that note, um, I'm delighted to say that we are joined by a brilliant panel of clerks and parliamentary staff from across the Commonwealth. We have a uh, representative here from the Isle of Man, uh, Australian Capital Territory in Australia, uh, New Zealand, UK, um, and People's Majlis in the Republic of Maldives as well. So we have a very broad range of voices here today, and I'm sure they're going to share some um, brilliant insights and experiences uh, from their respective legislatures. Now, before I stop talking and hand you over, um, I'll just go briefly over a few housekeeping points. Um, you should have all consented to this when entering the session, but just to remind you that this session is being recorded um, and we do intend to share the recording on social media uh, after the event. Uh, just to clarify as well, as attendees, you will not have the ability to unmute yourselves or turn your microphone on um, unless instructed to during the Q&A session, which will be a bit later on in the session. Uh, following the initial presentations from our panelists, uh, we will then go to a Q&A uh, session. For this, we'll predominantly use the hand raising function within Zoom. Um, so if you would like to ask a question during the Q&A session, please use the hand raising function, but only during the Q&A session, not in the initial presentations. Um, please try and keep your questions short and sweet. We want to get through as many questions as possible. And importantly as well, we, we really want to keep to time as well, because I'm sure you all have uh, very busy schedules. Um, now, before I hand you over to our first speaker, we will just do a brief uh, pre-assessment poll, uh, which should pop up on your screen now. Um, there we go. So if, it would be much appreciated if you wouldn't mind just taking a few seconds just to fill this out. Um, this is predominantly for internal uh, CPA purposes um, and importantly to monitor um, how we can improve upon these uh, webinars in the future because I'm sure there'll be uh, more to come. So it'd be great if you could fill that out. We're getting a good response rate, very good response rate. Thank you for that. And also, before we start the session, I encourage attendees to use the chat function. Uh, there you can chat uh, and um, communicate with all the attendees. So if you want to share your experiences, um, ask questions to fellow attendees, please feel free to use that. There will also be links to further resources that may or may not be referenced in the panel uh, discussions. Uh, so please make sure to check on those as well. So we've finished the poll. So without further ado, I'm going to stop talking now. Um, and hand you over to Jarvis Matia, who is the Acting Secretary General of the CPA. Thank you. Thank you, Jack, for that introduction. Uh, good morning, um, all. Uh, good evening, depending on where you are, or good afternoon. Um, it's a great pleasure for us in the CPA to organize and facilitate this webinar. Uh, as Jack has said, this is um, um, a milestone in our in our uh, work in order to uh, respond to uh, the changing needs of our society today in view of a pandemic that uh, we are facing. Um, I bring greetings to you all from the chairperson of the CPA, uh, Honorable Emilia Lifaka, uh, who is also Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly of, uh, of, of Cameroon. She wishes you well and hope that you're keeping safe. Um, I also recognize the uh, Vice Chairperson of the CPA, uh, Honorable John Ajaka, who is also President of the New South Wales 
uh, parliament uh, who is uh, attending this webinar um, uh, uh, this morning or this evening, depending on where you are. Welcome, um, uh, Honorable Ajaka. Um, and also to welcome you all uh, to this uh, webinar. Um, uh, following from the launch of the toolkit that we launched, which, which we did uh, last month, we felt that uh, it was important to uh, facilitate a conversation uh, within um, the CPA to involve clerks and uh, parliamentary staff to look at uh, what impact uh, the pandemic has had in terms of the operations of parliaments across the Commonwealth. We believe that uh, the importance of uh, this institution of parliament is so great that uh, despite a crisis, this crisis or despite any difficulties that uh, um, may face us, it is important that uh, the business of parliament should continue. And so this, this morning or this evening, we will have this opportunity to share experiences and uh, discuss as to how we can use um, um, information technology to facilitate uh, the business of parliament and for the institution to be able to discharge uh, its uh, responsibilities uh, to the people that it serves. And so we have um, 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 uh, experts or resource persons this morning or this evening who will be sharing and leading uh, the conversation this afternoon. We hope that um, uh, you'll find it very useful and please do let us know if we can improve uh, the delivery of these webinars, but also if there is anything that the CPA could do in order to support uh, parliaments as they struggle uh, with adjusting to the new way of working, which appears to be um, uh, the new normal. Uh, and, and I think for the future, uh, I think the impact of a of a coronavirus in terms of how we work it will it will change the way we work and therefore it is important for those of you that are involved in managing and running uh, parliament and parliamentary institutions to be um, on top of things in terms of uh, responding and ensuring that uh, parliament is operating um, as um, a useful. I want to thank um, uh, uh, Liam, uh, Jonathan for coming back again today uh, because we, 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 we had the pleasure of having uh, these two resource persons uh, in, the, in, the, in the session that we ran yesterday. I believe that this session has about 100 people and so we are very excited to see and to hear from you as to, see, as, as to how you think the Secretariat would, uh, would be able to support uh, you. I also want to thank Tom um, uh, for being available to share um, his expertise um, uh, during this, uh, this session. Uh, without um, uh, wasting much time, I, I, I once again want to thank you again, and please feel free to share your experiences or to ask any questions uh, after the presentations uh, have, been, have been made. Thank you very much, and I wish you all the best during the uh, conversation today. Thanks, Jack. Thank you very much, Jarvis, for those opening remarks. Um, so I'm not going to waste any time in passing over to our first panellist. Um, first up, we have Liam Lawrence-Smith, who is the Clerk of Legislation in the UK House of Commons. Uh, the UK has been very fast acting in terms of its response to the pandemic and have instituted both virtual and hybrid uh, sittings in Parliament uh, to date, um, as well as making the necessary amends to standing orders. Um, Liam, of course, has been um, central in these activities. Uh, so without further ado, I will pass it you over to Liam. Thank you, Liam. Right. Hello, everybody. I'm one of the clerks at the table uh, at the House of Commons. I want to show you a, some clips of how the House of Commons is working. And uh, if you look very closely, you should be able to catch a sight of me in the very last clip. So what we have is our select committees meeting entirely virtually. Um, we have the chamber with a mixture. And you can see if you look where we have green ticks and red crosses in the chamber, where you can or can't sit to keep a social distance in the chamber. While we have people also dialing in, we've progressed quite rapidly over the last couple of weeks from question time only into uh, debates on bills and secondary 
legislation and we are just on the point I heard today that our procedure committee has approved our remote voting solutions so we should be able to do everything in the chamber in future. The clip also includes something from the House of Lords who've taken a different approach and they are virtual only so they're not using their chamber at all. So if you can roll the clip please. Do we, do we have the video? <clears throat> we may have a few. <laughs> Sorry, it's coming, hold on. Technical um, issues, I think it's fast approaching. If there's an issue, we may move on uh, swiftly and come back to the video if there is an issue. Sorry, <coughs> it's coming. Hold on one sec. One of the questions we were asked yesterday is whether there we go. We have it. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you for waiting, everybody. Sorry, we don't have, we it. have it. Okay, so we don't have it currently. We will, in that case, move on to the next panellist, uh, Liam, and then after okay. um, the next panel is spoken, I'm sure we, we, we may have it up so we can play it then. Um, so I'll move quickly on in that. In the case of that technical uh, mishap, we have Tom Duncan. So Tom is the clerk of the Legislative Assembly um, of the Australian Capital Territory. The ACT Legislative Assembly has introduced already a number of changes to its um, operations, including the creation of a, a COVID-19 committee, uh, which will look at the financial and health response of the region's uh, response to the crisis. Uh, so without further ado, I will hand over to Tom. Thank you very much, Jack, and thank you very much to Jack and Jarvis, and I'm assuming that the Vice Chair can hear me, so um, I acknowledge the presence of the Vice Chair of the CPA, and as some people say, all protocols observed. I'm assuming that there are no other politicians uh, in present, but if there are, all protocols observed. Look, I'm just going to um, talk about the, the number of points that um, were suggested, and that is... Uh, panellists can choose to consider political considerations for transitioning to virtual sittings. I, I'm sure you, you have all experienced this, but there's been a very bipartisan approach to the, the crisis that has hit uh, parliaments, and they recognise that, like society has changed tremendously, parliaments have also had to, had to make significant changes, and that, and that has been a bipartisan approach across all the parliaments. All the members have recognised that it's an issue and, and have adjusted accordingly, and that's something that, that uh, has been welcome to see. The other big transition is that most members and all staff have been working from home, and that's been a, a major transition. We've never, we've often talked about people being able to work from home, but we've now, and, and I'm sure this is across the board, um, but we've actually managed to do it, and we seem to have done it really, relatively successfully. Um, in terms of modifications to the law or standing orders to enable virtual sittings, we only had to uh, tweak our, our standing orders to allow committees to operate virtually. So all of our seven standing committees are now having virtual public hearings and meeting virtually um, for private meetings as well. And that seems to have worked pretty well. The IT um, support has been good and that's been relatively smooth. In terms of changes in other parliamentary practices and procedures, J uh, Jack mentioned that we Following on from the New Zealand Parliament, um, we took, took the lead and also the New South Wales Legislative Council. We have established a select committee on COVID-19 pandemic response. And that is a five member committee chaired by the leader of the opposition with a non-government majority. And they have been having weekly meetings, uh, virtual meetings with the, both the Chief Minister and the Minister for Health to, as Jack said, to focus on the economic uh, consequences of the COVID-19 and also the health repercussions of the COVID-19 and that's been quite a um, quite an effective committee and they've had I think six or seven public hearings at the moment and um, 
that seems to have gone pretty well. Um, in terms of other um, procedural practices and changes, uh, we've had a number of occasions where we've had bills introduced and passed on the same day. And I know in some other jurisdictions and some other parliaments that may be somewhat normal, but it never happens in the ACP Legal Assembly. There is actually a standing order that says you, when you introduce a bill, you can't pass it at the same sitting. So we've had to suspend that standing order to allow a bill to be introduced and passed on the same sitting without going to a, to a scrutiny of bills and, and subordinate legislation committee, which is not, not ideal from a democracy point of view, but it, it just recognised the urgency and the necessity of getting that legislation quickly in place. And I think, again, there was a very bipartisan approach uh, for all the members. Um, of course, we, we haven't been operating virtually. We have uh, operated with a, a minimum quorum, which is 13 out of 25 members. And so we've had to space members across the chamber to make sure that they're 1.5 metres apart. Um, and that has been, um, that has been organised by the WHIPs. So the WHIPs have, 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 have assumed a bit more of a prominent role in our legislature. They're the ones that decide who goes into the chamber and who doesn't go in the chamber. Uh, and the other major change is we've drastically reduced, reduced the number of sittings. Originally, we were due to sit for 15 days this year because we have an election in October. Uh, it was reduced originally to five. But now that Australia seems to have done reasonably well in terms of compared to some other countries, so we've now restored it back to 11 sittings. Um, and I know some of the other Australian parliaments, and I'll leave President Ajaka to talk about it in New South Wales, but there were other parliaments that adjourned until August and September that are now coming back a little bit earlier and, and having additional sittings. So uh, that's important. In terms of the overview of how sittings are administered and what platforms are used, there's been a big battle between Zoom and WebEx in our assembly. The government prefers WebEx because they maintain that the security settings are, are much better on WebEx. Uh, but for ease of use, um, the, the committees and the committee chairs seem to prefer Zoom. So there has been a bit of a standoff there about which which technology to use. But one thing I I will observe is that we'll all become experts with WebEx and Zoom by the end of this end of this pandemic. You know, I think we're all much more. Um, in terms of uh, overview of how committee meetings are conducted, they've um, they're all done virtually now, so I can't add any further to that. Um, and the only the only thing, just on the last point, in terms of advice for legislatures with less resources or small legislatures, well, we are a small legislature, but we have benefited tremendously. We have established a, an email contact with the 15 Australian clerks, um, and, and including sometimes the New Zealand clerk as well. And we talk to each other probably every week and every often daily about what we are doing respectively to address the, the, the crises and the, the procedural dilemmas we've got. Um, and so that's been a useful network um, in terms of being able to sort of come up with any solutions that, that are posed by the, by the pandemic. And, and, and so my only advice to legislatures is to, there are a lot of other small legislatures out there, including the whole CPA network, who I, I would encourage you to sort of use those networks because they can they can often provide really good solutions to some of the problems that we're all all facing and, and, and they're often very similar problems. So that's uh, six minutes and forty seconds. So Jack, I'm going to stick to my time frame and um, hand over to the next panelist. But happy to take questions at the end. Excellent. Thanks for that really uh, interesting and informative um, presentation, Tom. And well done for sticking on time as well. <laughs> so I think we're going to try uh, Liam's video again. Uh, so just to remind you, this is some footage from the UK Parliament um, in terms of their virtual and hybrid sittings. Order! Order. Yesterday, the House agreed to a motion to allow members to participate virtually in proceedings of the House for the first time in 700 years of history of the House of Commons.
So I'd like to welcome everyone, both members joining us remotely from their constituencies up and down the UK and members here in the Chamber, to the first hybrid sitting of the House of Commons. I thank honourable members who are present in the Chamber for continuing to observe the guidance that has been issued about social distancing, not only in relation to each other but also in relation to the staff of the House who are in the Chamber and indeed myself. Before we begin, I want to place on record that the parliamentary privilege applies to all members participating on the same basis, regardless of whether they are contributing virtually or present in the Chamber. Also, of course, the same rules and courtesies apply to members participating virtually, as far as practical, as they do the members participating physically. Members present in the chamber should not rise in their places to catch my eye, but wait to be called, although they should then rise to speak as well, if they are in the chamber. My Lords, virtual proceedings of the House of Lords will now begin. I'd like to remind members that these proceedings are subject to parliamentary privilege and what we say is available to the public, both in Hansard and to those listening uh, and now watching. We are resuming our live streaming uh, today, so we're very much back on air. I remind participating members that their microphones will be set to mute and that they should uh, immute their microphones shortly before we reach their place in the speakers list and members are asked not to use the group chat function my lords the virtual proceedings on oral questions will now commence i will call each oral question in the normal way i will then call on the minister to make the initial response then i will call on the lord who asked the original question to ask their supplementary question then the minister will again respond and I will then call in turn those lords asking supplementary questions as listed on the speakers list. Please do ensure that questions and answers are, are short because if they're not it excludes other people and I apologise in advance if it's not possible for everyone to be called. I ask each speaker to ensure that their microphone is unmuted prior to asking the supplementary question. Uh, each speaker's microphone will be returned to mute uh, once their supplementary question has finished. In accordance uh, with the guidance agreed by the Procedure Committee, uh, I should remind uh, members, if they are not listed, it is not possible to ask a supplementary question nor take part in proceedings. I think it's fair to say that I'm surprised to be introducing a motion to introduce remote voting in the House of Commons. In general, I'm not an advocate of change to the House's voting system or, to be perfectly honest, to many other things. It's always look, look, Lord Palmerston's words ring in my mind, change, change, aren't things bad enough already? Um, uh, and I am strongly of the view that our current approach is the best one. But as I said yesterday, parliamentary procedure is not an end in itself, but a means to allow the institution to function successfully. We are facing a particular set of circumstances that have required us to be innovative so that we can ensure that the House of Commons can both scrutinise the government and continue to legislate. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Today, I make my maiden speech in circumstances I could have never imagined. I always said I got into politics to serve the community that I love and have lived in all of my life. And I always said I'd somehow redefine what it meant to be a constituency MP. So along with making history as the first female MP for the area and the youngest Conservative MP in the country and the first Member of Parliament ever to make the maiden speech remotely from their own home. And I do this, Mr Deputy Speaker, because I wanted to stay here, rooted into my community, to rise to the challenges we face. Because as I've always said, we are stronger together. And it would be remiss of me not to mention my predecessor, Graham Jones, for his nine years of service. And to remind you that for the first time in 27 years, Hindburn returned a Conservative MP. 
Yeah. Any congratulations, Sarah. Stella Creasy. Mr Deputy Speaker, I hope that you can hear me. Um, I'd like to start by congratulating the member from Heimborn for an extraordinary maiden speech. It's difficult to make these at the best of times. I hope I can tell her that I think her mum would have been extremely proud of her and join her in wishing her dad happy birthday. Can I also say that many of us on this side of the house are extremely grateful for what she said about her predecessor. Mr Deputy Speaker, through the action this government has taken, and with the support of the whole House, we will defeat this virus. We've heard speeches from Shetlands to Devon Central and many constituencies in between. And everyone is committed to ensuring that the government does everything it can to relieve the distress that our nation is now enduring. We will shepherd our country safely through this period of uncertainty and disruption. And the United Kingdom will emerge from this crisis stronger, more resilient and more united than before. And for all these reasons, Mr Deputy Speaker, I commend this bill to the House. Yay. And I too would like to associate myself with the comments of the Shadow Minister in thanking all those who have made uh, today's proceedings work so smoothly. Thank you very much. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. As many as are of that opinion say aye, aye. the contrary no, I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Finance bill programme motion to be moved formally. I beg to move. The question is, as on the order paper, as many as are of that opinion say aye, aye. the contrary no, I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. The House now stands adjourned. Order, order. So just to say, you can see a mix of things there about the House of Commons, the presence of the mace, the presence of the Speaker and deputies, the capacity to take decisions where they're not contested. And then next week, we will have our secure voting uh, in place so we can try to conduct divisions remotely, um, which we're looking forward to. OK, so I'm very happy to take questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liam, for your presentation and the video as well, which we fortunately managed to play in the end. Um, so I'm now going to move quickly on to our next panellists. Uh, we have Hans Landon Lane. Hans is the digital lead at the New Zealand Parliament. Um, so he's been central to many of the transitions and efforts that uh, the New Zealand Parliament has made, uh, which have included the creation of an epidemic response committee, uh, which will specifically scrutinise uh, government action on the uh, response to the pandemic. Um, as well as a host of other new and existing legislation that the Parliament has introduced. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Hans. Uh, thanks very much. Um, uh, <laughs> um, as Jack said, I'm the digital lead at the New Zealand Parliament within the Parliamentary Engagement Unit, uh, which usually means I'm more uh, accustomed to dealing with social media, uh, the website, uh, apps, um, the internet, than procedural considerations. Um, but in an environment where the entire Parliament has pivoted to digital delivery, um, I find myself at an unusual nexus between uh, the digital and the procedural. Um, I'm going to focus today on um, the remote participation in committees that our parliament has adopted recently. Um, unlike others, uh, we don't have remote participation in the house. Um, we've uh, yes taken our own path, which I'll go through as quickly as possible. Um, so on February uh, yes, February 28th, New Zealand recorded its first case of COVID-19 um, and less than a month later, on March 25th, um, the Civil Defence Minister declared a state of emergency which allowed the government to invoke an extraordinarily broad suite of powers under the Epidemic Preparedness Act. Um, these pauses, powers are so broad that under the text of the statute itself, um, 
is a recognition um, that the the government should um, take extra care to uh, involve parliamentary scrutiny and make it um, not take advantage of these powers, essentially. Um, our challenge was to keep Parliament in the picture during these COVID-19 restrictions, uh, which would prevent the House from sitting safely. Um, finding some way of uh, filling the, the role that oral questions usually play in ministerial statements, um, dealing with uh, restrictions on attendance by the public, including the press gallery, um, and the practical difficulty of uh, virtual settings of the House, which for various reasons uh, would be difficult for us to implement in the same way that the House of Commons or even the People's Majlis uh, have managed to do so efficaciously. Uh, our response was to uh, enable virtual meetings of select committees via Zoom, uh, that those virtual meetings being uh, enabled by a sessional order. Uh, the establishment of a cross-party epidemic response committee chaired by the leader of the opposition and with an opposition majority, uh, with an extraordinarily broad remit to hold the government to account over all aspects of its uh, response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and lastly, uh, <laughs> through a rather unusual workflow, we managed to secure TV and radio broadcasts of the ERC proceedings, of the Epidemic Response Committee proceedings, despite that committee being held in Zoom and despite Zoom not lending itself particularly well to TV broadcast. Um, I'll share a little bit about how we achieved that. Um, so for background, our select committees already widely use Zoom for hearings of evidence and for public live streams. Um, although there wasn't room in uh, standing orders for remote participation in committees, they often use uh, Zoom to hear from witnesses, um, which meant that a lot of those conversations around the, the privileged status of Zoom material had already been had. Uh, we had a strong business analysis in place, including security assessments. It's worth noting that a lot of the security issues that have dogged the use of Zoom um, for um, executive purposes, like uh, for cabinet meetings and such, are not issues uh, for the use of Zoom when it comes to public select committee meetings. All the content in them is designed for a public uh, audience by definition. Um, so for us, we were able to uh, start using Zoom quite quickly. As it turns out, it was later adopted by the executive for cabinet meetings, um, but they've done their own security analysis on that front. Um, as I mentioned, we also had procedural limitations on digital participation. There was uh, no uh, allowance for remote participation in committees. Um, so we were left with empty select committee rooms, uh, the government exercising extraordinary powers um, and a need for parliament to continue holding them to account. Um, the sessional order was made uh, to allow the speaker to approve special arrangements for select committees to conduct their business, including uh, remote participation, because we already had Zoom set up um, and uh, because it was already familiar to members as well as to the select committee secretariat, that was uh, chosen as our weapon of choice. Uh, so those procedural changes were made. There was an agency-wide rollout of Zoom um, across both the parliamentary service and the office of the clerk, which was facilitated by um, our IST team working very hard, very quickly. Um, the select committee secretariat rapidly tested uh, this new application of Zoom um, and developed new protocols to maintain Zoom hygiene. So for example, um, holding private meetings and public hearings of evidence in entirely separate Zoom events to prevent any crossover um, and inadvertent broadcast of sensitive or private material. We also developed support resources for members and other new users of Zoom. Uh, as you've all seen over the last couple of weeks, I'm sure uh, there is a vast range of uh, comfort levels, connectivity, cameras, um, which leads to a pretty motley output, but we did our best to support members through this, uh, suddenly becoming their own AV people. Uh, finally, we uh, worked on uh, the broadcasting angle, which I'll come to shortly, and working with the media so that the media were able to pick up our, um, our live streams and our broadcasts, put that onto their own channels and help us to reach a larger audience. Um, not many people tune into Parliament for fun, um, for their entertainment and their information, they're tapped into other news networks. So it was crucial that we make our content available on those channels as well. Um, so at the moment, we have a situation where all select committees are able to meet by Zoom. Some of them choose to, uh, many of them are used to it. Um, some of them have chosen not to meet at all, that's up to them. Um, 
this is our health select committee. They chose to meet because they're under quite a lot of pressure at the moment to uh, hear submissions on vaping legislation. So it suited them very, very well to be able to meet as regularly as they would have had we not been in lockdown. Um, the characteristics of virtual committees, as, uh, as I mentioned, uh, each committee can determine the frequency with which it meets and whether or not it chooses to use Zoom. Uh, new protocols around security and Zoom hygiene. We use webinars for public broadcasts. We use meetings for private meetings. They have different toolkits, um, horses for courses. Uh, the emphasis was on public availability. We found that members, if we weren't broad, able to broadcast or live stream for any reason, members missed it very quickly. They got instant online feedback from their constituents who wanted to watch what was going on. Um, it seems ghoulish to look for a silver lining in all of this, but this really has helped us to put parliamentary procedure in front of a whole new audience of people who don't have much to do right now and are very invested in uh, Parliament's work. Um, as I mentioned, there was also a range of um, camera quality, oh, sorry, uh, experience with the tools and connectivity. That's okay. People just want to be able to see what's going on. They were very forgiving of the varying levels of quality. Um, we also found that the secretariat staff were placed front and centre, and in, uh, sometimes in confronting ways. Um, one long-suffering member of the secretariat for the new epidemic response committee uh, has managed all of their national broadcasts from her linen cupboard. So members are now intimately familiar with the colour of her towels because they're visible behind her on a daily basis. Um, we've had to provide extra support to uh, secretariat staff in order to um, help them navigate a very unusual process. They also literally have their finger on the button throughout the meeting. They have the power to mute members um, to remove them from the room. Um, powers that in a real life setting would be restricted to a sergeant of arms, um, but one click in Zoom. So that was a new thing to navigate as well. The Epidemic Response Committee uh, was established unanimously and with an apolitical genesis uh, on the suggestion of the chair. It's had uh, really excellent buy-in from all political persuasions. Um, the, uh, leader of the opposition chairs the, meet, uh, the committee uh, and the majority of members are also opposition members. Um, the cross-party buy one more minute. Sorry, Hans, yep, just one sure. minute. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sure this will be covered elsewhere, uh, including in a CPA article that, as I understand, is forthcoming. Um, public visibility was of very high interest to all of the members of the committee. Um, it replaced ministerial statements. Uh, so we've had ministers coming in as uh, witnesses three times a week every week uh, for several hours a day. Uh, we've also had expert uh, witnesses and uh, voices from the sector who've been able to frame the conversation. So it's been a really uh, useful and collaborative mode to showcase Parliament in. As promised, here is our broadcast workflow. Uh, members participated in Zoom. Uh, Zoom allows you to output a stream via RTP, uh, RTMPS protocol. Uh, we sent this to an Amazon Web Services decoder, which is basically a YouTube of one uh, which our broadcasting team uh, at Cordia were able to play out on a computer plugged into their broadcasting equipment. Um, so from a uh, workflow that was designed purely for social media live streaming, we've been able to generate a television broadcast from within the same program that we're using today. Um, from there, we were able to tap into our usual broadcasting workflow, including uh, making the content available on radio. Uh, this did a lot to... Um, address the digital divide. People who don't have a very good internet connection or who have to prepay their internet were still able to follow along these incredibly important parliamentary proceedings and help hold the government to account, um, which resulted in extremely high levels of public engagement, uh, unprecedented audiences for us. This is now officially our most watched committee ever. Um, if you think of the maximum, uh, uh, maximum audience for a traditional committee being 100 people in a room, uh, we were reaching uh, 20,000 plus people within the course of a live stream. Um, we're now looking at whether we can use our Parliament TV channel more effectively to uh, broadcast select committee proceedings beyond the lockdown period. Um, in terms of lessons learnt, we're now looking at what we want to retain. Um, the ability of members to be able to participate in these committees remotely has been very useful um, and that may well be something that the Parliament wishes to continue doing even after these restrictions have ended, um, particularly since it would allow members to uh, meet more easily in non-sitting weeks when they've, many of them have returned to their electorates. Um, thank you very much. 
many thanks Hans for that uh, really fascinating uh, presentation and it's really interesting to see the response of the New Zealand Parliament. Uh, so I'm going to quickly move on to our fourth panellist. We have Jonathan King. Jonathan's the Deputy Clerk of the Tinwald in the Parliament of the Isle of Man um, and they were one of the first parliaments to conduct fully virtual uh, parliamentary sittings so um, without further ado I will hand over to Jonathan. Thank you Jack. Um, uh, well, good morning, Mr. Ajaka, and uh, good morning, Jarvis, uh, Jack, and fellow panelists. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak to this excellent event. Um, I'm going to speak for uh, seven minutes, and so necessarily, I, I hope I will leave questions unanswered. Uh, please do use the question time at the end, and please do follow up with me uh, privately after the event if there's anything here that is of interest to you. Um, the Isle of Man is the world's oldest parliament in continuous operation. It's a small parliament serving a community of about 85,000 85, people in the middle of the British Isles and the parliament has 35 members and the parliamentary staff is about 23 people. So that's where we're coming from. Uh, this is a picture of our uh, main Tinwald Court chamber with the 35 members all sitting together in happier times. Uh, you might just be able to see at the uh, top of the picture to, to, towards the right a television screen with a logo on it. That screen is only used as part of our electronic voting system and uh, normally in, uh, when, when it comes to a division in Tinwald people vote by pressing a yes or no button, which looks like that. And uh, I mention that because, of course, voting is one of the issues which has been mentioned already and is quite tricky uh, when we move to the virtual... Sorry, parliament. Jonathan. Yes. You might want to just full screen the presentation. I thought I was. It's certainly full screening on mine. Is it not working? Uh, we can only see the first page, so you may have shared a separate screen. That's really weird. Um, let me change Maybe it. Maybe cancel it and then start again. Yeah, I'll start again. Uh, that's really weird. Think we have it now. If you... Is that any better? No. If you want to, we can see your mouse moving. If you want to keep uh, presenting, and I think one of our staff uh, CPA have their presentation so they can share the screen. Um, I tell you what, Jack. Uh, let's let's sure. forget the, uh, the the pictures because I know that uh, time is running on. So I'll I'll, I'll just uh, explain to you participants what I was going to talk about. Um, we have we we went on a very fast journey in the second half of March from sitting uh, in our normal chamber to sitting virtually. So our, our uh, minister in uh, <clears throat> in order to explain the journey that we went on and the speed at which we went on it, it is necessary to know a little bit about where we started and that's why I was going to show you pictures of our normal chamber. Uh, the key points for the purposes of virtual systems are that uh, we already distribute all papers electronically by default. Uh, that's something which we've been uh, developing over about the last 10 years. So uh, uh, since our last general election in 2016, members have been told that papers only come electronically if they really must have them printed out, they can ask, but nobody does, and they're very used to working electronically. Um, all of our, uh, we don't have television, but, but we do have audio, and the audio is uh, I we streamed. Have oh, very good. Let, let's let's yeah. go down the slides then. I think I'm on about slide six at the minute. So if you want to just run through them, that's where we are. Next slide, that's our normal chamber. That's our normal voting. That's our electronic distribution of papers. That's our live streaming. And uh, the next slide, please. That's us in normal times using Zoom, or in fact Skype on that occasion, to take evidence uh, remotely from, from remote witnesses. 
Although, of course, at that time, all of the committee were sitting in the room together. And as I say, um, that, is, that was our starting point. Uh, for the remainder of the time, I'm going to describe the virtual chamber which we put in place within about a week. And I think the, the theme of my uh, remarks is that we used available people and available equipment, but used them in a different way. And that way we were able to do this uh, extremely quickly and extremely cheaply. So I recommend this approach to anyone who's uh, suffering from resource constraints. Um, the 23rd of March was a big day for us because uh, ministers gave a briefing to members and to the public saying from that point everybody must work at home if they possibly can. Uh, we weren't able to run sittings at home immediately so for a couple of weeks we operated in a social distancing uh, system within our own chamber. If I could have the next slide please. That is us social distancing within our own chamber. So as you can see, the members have spaced themselves out and they've spilled over into the public gallery above that television screen at the back. Now, uh, at the same time, we also sent as many staff home as possible and we excluded the public. So we still allowed 35 members in the chamber, but we went right down to three members of staff to support the whole thing and public weren't able to be there. Although you can just see, I think there's a journalist uh, pointing a camera uh, at a member speaking uh, at the bar of the court there. He's speaking at the bar because he's not allowed in his normal seat and people who were sitting in the gallery had to come down in order to speak, come down the stairs. So that was not ideal. Uh, if we move to the next slide, please. So while we were running that social distancing chamber, we were also building our virtual chamber. And in a couple of seconds, I'm gonna explain our virtual chamber to you. Uh, it operates with five people in the building, uh, the four people in the picture there and the person who took the photograph. So that is our two presiding officers and two clerks. Um, the senior clerk and the uh, third person from the left in the photograph is my, my boss, Roger, and he continued to do his normal duties of providing procedural advice to the chair. Uh, the other clerk, which in this case is me, uh, operated the teams that operated the video conferencing console if we move to the next slide please that is uh, the uh, teams clerk i view of the virtual chamber you can see that i have got some pieces of paper there to hold up the word dissent or no dissent and that is uh, how we do our voting in the virtual chamber the president says it is assumed the motion is carried unless someone indicates dissent if you wish to indicate dissent, please do so now. And the person on the Teams console counts to five. And if uh, five seconds elapse and nobody has indicated dissent, then the, we hold up the no dissent sign and the president announces that the motion is carried. Um, if we could have the next slide, please. This is a close up of the heart of the virtual chamber. Uh, you can see there a pair of loudspeakers uh, feeding straight into a microphone. This is uh, was described by our speaker as a bit blue Peter in an article he published, uh, but it's deliberate and it's done that way because it works and actually uh, very similar to, to Hans's uh, des uh, design in, in, in effect. We have a Teams meeting uh, which generates audio output and we feed the audio output into the existing system for Hansard recording and for streaming and for broadcasting on the radio. If I could have the next slide, please. This is uh, what we see in the chat box on the Teams meeting when it's working properly. Uh, members use the chat box to indicate a desire to speak. And the, uh, originally we designed this for a president who had never used video conferencing before. To be fair, very few of us had. And we designed it that the clerk would, tell, would read the chat box and tell the president by passing a note who wished to speak. Actually, as time's worn on, the president has become more confident reading this himself. So that's one job we have to do uh, rather less over time. But it does work for a president with absolutely no uh, IT competence, if you need that. Let's have the next slide, please. And this is how we do the voting. As you can see at the top of the page here, people are speaking. And then a member says dissent. That's in response to the thing I said before. So the president says, anyone like to dissent? 
somebody dissents, the clerk writes a vote, and then everybody votes. And if I could show the next slide, please. Uh, one clerk reads out uh, the votes, and the other clerk counts them using a sheet like this, all very traditional, very cheap, and it works. If I could have the next slide, please. To hurry, oh, we're, we're at the end anyway. This, is the, this is the last <laughs> slide. I will just use this slide to say it uh, for, for us, it has been a, a very new experience. We did manage to fix uh, virtual sittings within about a week. Uh, this slide shows our annual outdoor sitting of Timbald Court, and it's taking us rather longer to work out what to do about this. But I hope to welcome you to this uh, event in the Isle of Man uh, one day in happier times. Thank you very much, Jack. Brilliant. Thanks for that presentation, Jonathan. I'm sure the attendees uh, got a lot from that and how you conduct your virtual sittings. So I'm excited to be joined by Mohammed Hussain. Mohammed is the Director of IT at the People's Majlis of the Republic of Maldives. The Maldives have been one of the uh, first uh, parliaments to conduct fully virtual sittings. Um, and in addition, I'm sure you're all aware, uh, the Maldives have recently rejoined the Commonwealth. So I am delighted to be joined by Mohammed. Um, without further ado, without wasting any further time, I will uh, pass over to you, Mohammed. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Hello, everyone. Today I'm going to share with you how I experience in hosting virtual sessions for the Majlis, uh, especially uh, on technological challenges and solutions. Uh, I will start with a brief overview and share with you the technologies and the tools that we have used. I will also walk you through conducting the virtual sessions, the steps, and uh, how we have managed broadcasting and live streaming. We have also prepared some basic guidelines for members to follow during the virtual sessions. I will conclude with uh, some uh, key points that we have learned through this experience. As you know, the Microsoft Teams platform is a general purpose video conferencing platform that is not specifically designed for uh, parliamentary sessions. So it posed some limitations and it has some limitations and posed some challenges. But uh, we were able to uh, uh, do uh, sessions using Teams. Uh, <clears throat> we were able to prepare for the first virtual session in just 10 days. I think because uh, we have managed to do uh, the preparation in such a short, short period uh, because we have already met some uh, prerequisites. For example, no amendments were required to the current rule of procedure and also we already had uh, the appropriate network infrastructure in place. Uh, members already had access to laptops or smartphones that they can use to connect uh, to sessions remotely from home and they have uh, sufficient internet connectivity. Finally, we have a team of highly skilled IT support personnel. These are the tools and technologies that we have used to facilitate virtual sessions. Uh, as I mentioned, we use Microsoft Teams as the video conferencing platform. We also use Microsoft Outlook um, to schedule meetings, but I will cover that in, in a bit. Uh, Polly is the head-on for Microsoft Teams that we use for voting. OBS Studio is used for live streaming the session over YouTube. Together with OpenVPN and tight VNC, we can remotely access the computers at office from our homes. Discord is an application that we use uh, to maintain a separate communication channel with the speaker and the security staff, apart from the Teams session. NewTek TriCaster and the NewTek uh, Spark device are used uh, to broadcast the session uh, over to local TV channels. I will quickly go through these steps in our virtual session. Uh, scheduling is done, uh, uh, scheduling can be done in Teams calendar view, but uh, we use Outlook to create a Teams meeting so that we can take advantage of Outlook address groups to add multiple participants at once. Uh, 
Uh, we have not uh, to measure that if Outlook is used, the same account must be used to log into the Teams during the session in order to uh, get uh, set, set the meeting options. While we invite the participants, we uh, invite secretariat staff as presenters and rest of the members as attendees. This way we can easily uh, determine how many members are present at any given time. For instance, during the start, uh, at the start of the session, we may want to know if there is a quorum and we can easily see how many members are present in the session. In preparation for the session, the administrative staffs will upload the documents to Teams chat so that members can access the documents. When it is time for members to join the session, the organizer also ensures that the microphones are muted when they join. During the session, members can unmute their microphones themselves before speaking, and the organizer ensures they, that they mute the microphone after they speak or when the uh, allocated time is up. This is very important to reduce unnecessary audio inputs or feedback. Uh, in order to maintain a private communication channel with the speaker and rest of the secretary staff, we use an application called Discord. It supports audio, video, and also chat. We have created separate channels uh, within Discord for speaker, secretary general, council general, and another channel for the rest of the supporting staff. Request speak and point of order requests are made through Teams chat by typing in the chat. Uh, administrative staff takes the no note of these requests and communicates them to the speaker with the private Discord channel. For voting, we have tried different options. SurveyMonkey provides very basic functionality, but there's no option to close the poll or it fails to update when voting options are changed from one option to another. Microsoft Forms is simple and easy to use, but again, there's no option to close the poll. Detailed vote results are also not available within Teams, but we can access the details on Microsoft Office website. Out of the three, Poly uh, is the most appropriate for our purpose, uh, despite limitations. For example, the minimum duration we can set uh, is 30 minutes, but we, uh, we can close the poll manually at any time. So it works for our purpose. Um, Poly does not work within Teams chat, but it works within Teams channels. So we have created a uh, separate channel for voting purposes and the link to the channel is posted in the meeting chat so that members can jump from the chat to the appropriate voting channel easily. With Poly, results are also automated, uh, automatically generated. For broadcasting, we have uh, set up a dedicated PC at the chamber while we were doing the preparation. The PC is controlled remotely with a tight VNC. The NewTek Spark device sends audio and video from the PC to the NewTek TriCaster over the network. And then the tri TriCaster broadcasts the feed to local TV channels through our dedicated fiber network. Uh, in normal sessions, we can use the TriCaster for live streaming and recording as well, but because we cannot control these options remotely, we use OBS Studio installed on the PC to live stream the session to YouTube. Uh, and later on, we can access the video recording from YouTube when the live, live stream is over. Some guidelines for members, um, but I will, I will not go into details. In conclusion, we have learned that uh, for, in order to properly function, we need uh, uh, functioning hardware and software as well as sufficient internet connectivity to run a smooth virtual session. And another thing is etiquette. Etiquette is very important because uh, the organizers do not have full control over members' microphones. Uh, so uh, discipline and etiquette is very important. Another thing is that the need for continuous training. We have provided trainings for the members at the beginning of the virtual sessions, but we found that we need to continually train them on various aspects in order to run these sessions smoothly. That's it. Thank you for listening.
Excellent. Thank you for that uh, brilliant presentation, Mohammed. And it's uh, it's really interesting to see some of the detailed technical solutions as well as the challenges uh, that the people's matches has, uh, has, has faced and overcome. Um, so we are going to now finally move over to the Q&A section of the uh, panel discussion. Uh, before I do that, I am pleased to say we are joined by the Honourable Kate Dowse, who is the President of the Legislative Council in uh, Western Australia. So I do welcome you as well, in addition to the Honourable uh, John Ajaka. Um, so before we uh, move on to the Q&A, just to remind you that we will predominantly use the hand raising function within Zoom. Um, so if you do have a question, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, we will then um, try and do it in rounds of three. Um, so please answer your, uh, ask your questions nice and short and sweet so we have a chance to get through everyone. Um, and then we shall then conclude the session. So um, we did receive some pre-submitted questions in the registration. So I will give priority to those uh, if they want, would like to present those questions to the panel. Um, so if you would like to raise your hands and we can um, take some questions. So we have Xiao uh, Peng Han, she is from the parliament in Singapore, I believe. So I will invite uh, Xiao to ask her question. Hi, Xiao. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a he, unfortunately, so. <laughs> oh, sorry, my apologies. <laughs> uh, my, my, my question is for, for Liam, Liam Lawrence, uh, on, on secure voting and division. Um, I just want to ask is if your secure voting is through a mobile phone, and uh, if so, how do you ensure that a member is actually logged in for the Zoom meeting and actually present the session before voting through his mobile phone? That's assuming it's by mobile phone. Um, we've, we've tried to make the mobile voting work on a number of different platforms and we do use a mobile phone to text people to alert them that the vote is happening. We already had an app set up called Member Hub and this is our preferred way for members and their duly designated staff to um, table parliamentary questions. So voting is now added as a functionality to that member hub and they can't delegate the voting to their, their staff and the tr trials have been carried out very I think we may have lost Liam for a second there. People are that top. Okay, so Liam, I think your connection may have dropped uh, slightly. Um, so I will uh, open it up to uh, any of the other panel members if they want to um, respond. So had any additional comments uh, to the question? No, Liam, I think you may be back. Sorry, that was Hi, my answer. I think I just lost you for a moment. We, we lost you for yeah. the, probably the last 30 seconds. So if you wanted to wrap up again, perhaps. Um, I was just going to say that the, the remote solution depends on the access for that. Fortunately, the connection did drop again there, Liam. So we may come back to you. Um, to conclude that question. Uh, we will move on. Uh, thank you, CO. Um, we will try and get that answered um, if Liam connection if Liam's connection um, picks up again shortly, but thank you for that. Um, so we did receive lots of questions before the session. Um, I see some people maybe camera shy and raising their hands. Uh, so I do encourage you to put your hand up if you if you want to ask a question. This is your opportunity. Um, if not the case, I shall um, pose myself some of the written questions that we did receive. Um, so I think one of the uh, repetitive ones that we 
did get was the implications um, in terms of managing and amending standing orders uh, to accommodate for both virtual and um, hybrid uh, sittings. So I may go to Tom first uh, if he wants to answer and then um, I'll open that for the rest of the panel um, for additional comments. Uh, well, thank you, Jack. Yeah, look, the only, uh, we didn't have many standing orders to amend, but the only one we did have to amend was um, because we were socially distancing in the chamber, members uh, couldn't sit at their normal seats and speak. Uh, unless, and so we had to amend that standing order to, to enable members to sit from virtually any seat in the chamber to enable them to participate in proceedings. Um, that was the main, um, and as I said, we had to suspend standing orders to allow bills to be introduced and passed on the same day, which is, which is not our normal practice. But other than that, a lot, a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the changes were not related to parliamentary change or standing order changes. They were just agreements with the whips about who was going to be in the chamber and who wasn't going to be in the chamber, which is not regulated by standing orders. It's just um, the sort of, and I, as I alluded to, the bipartisan nature of the of the, of the uh, approach to the pandemic, and, and um, so that luckily did not necessitate any changes to standing orders. So relatively few changes to the standing orders in, in my jurisdiction. Okay, thank you for that, Tom. Um, I don't know if there's any additional comments um, from other experiences uh, from the panel. Uh, we do have. Yes, Jonathan. Well, in, in the Isle of Man, every virtual sitting begins with a motion moved by the Speaker of the House of Keys that standing orders be suspended to the extent necessary to conduct this sitting virtually. And uh, that so far has been uh, supported by everybody. I think it's quite a useful discipline though, just to remind everybody each time that this is not normal, even though we might call it the new normal, and that in the future it might become something people debate once the question arises, is it time to go back into the physical chamber? Thank you, Jonathan. Oh, so we do have another hand up um, from Anastasia. So I'll allow Anastasia uh, Neku to talk uh, from Ghana. Um, she will now have opportunity to present to the panel. Hello, Anastasia. Hi there, Anastasia. Hello, good morning. Good morning, how are you? Yeah, I am fine. Please, I, I want to find out, uh, in Ghana we have a place for the, the press corps, the media. So in this virtual parliament, I want to know how effective we can take care of the press corps or the media. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Anastasia, for that question. I may go to Hans uh, first. Um. Hi Anastasia. Uh, in our case, we, uh, when designing our live streaming and broadcasting process, we made it as flexible as possible and we worked with our press corps uh, to make sure that they could pick up our broadcast and put it on their own channels. Um, so for example, we provided the manifest URL for our live stream, uh, which is something they could plug into their own encoders and broadcast it on their own channels. Um, the uh, executive as well has been uh, working very closely with the press gallery in order to make sure the latest updates about the epidemic uh, uh, get out. So there are uh, daily press conferences uh, within our executive wing that are uh, widely broadcast and live streamed as well. I will leave that open to uh, anyone else in the panel if they have any additional comments, perhaps Mohammed. Um, uh, in our case, uh, as I have mentioned in my presentation, we have a dedicated fiber network with uh, major local TV channels, but there are some other uh, channels or in internet-based uh, media uh, outlets, uh, they can follow us on uh, our live stream on YouTube. Uh, all the sessions are live streamed on YouTube, including plenary sessions and also committee sessions. I hope that answers. 
Thank you. So if there are no additional comments from the panel, uh, we do have several more questions coming in. So thank you, um, Anastasia, for your question. So we will bring in Eve Sampson, um, Nigel Pratt, um, and then Susan Katono um, for their questions. Thank you very much Hi. for... Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Excellent. Thank you very much for your interesting presentations. I was very struck by the bipartisanship and the acceptance that parliaments had to do things differently, very fast and with less opportunity, if I shall put it, for dissent or debate than is normal. Is there any sign of that bipartisanship eroding in any area, in any any of the um, present assemblies? Uh, may I thank you, Eve? I will. I'll invite. I was. I'll, I'll just invite Nigel and Susan to ask their questions, and then we will take a sort of broad uh, response to the questions from the panel. Yes. Hello. Good morning. Hi. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Susan. Hi. Um, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. My name is Susan Katono from the Parliament of Uganda, and. Um, we, we've, we've also had, uh, we are currently conducting a hybrid kind of uh, system where we have the physical attendance in the, in the chamber as well as the, the virtual presence. And um, I, I was wondering uh, whether we have, um, in the various parliaments that have been discussed, whether we have rules on what should be visible to the pub to to on on the on the different platforms. For example, we've had members some the dress code and uh, the backgrounds. Have you uh, have your rules extended to such what can be visible to us who are listening, who are watching you? For example, what sort of background should you have? And also in the case of tabling of documents. I, I think one of the presenters, panelists, talked about uh, a member hub, but I didn't get that so well because my network was cutting. Because we are struggling, how do we table documents? For example, instant tabling. There are times when members want to uh, allude to some document and you want them to table that document for everybody to see. So I wanted to get experiences from other countries. I, I think I have, I had a question on voting, but I think I have. I'm kind of uh, okay now with how yeah. people are voting in the different. So mainly it's about uh, visibility. What are we Thank showing? You, and I can, can you sit anywhere and uh, present to Parliament? Thank you, Susan. No. Um, and we will just quickly go to Nigel and then I'll invite all the panel then to, to make their responses. I will. Hi, um, Nigel. Thank you. Thank you, Jack, and um, thank you for all the panellists uh, for presenting today. This is a, a terrific way to, for us to, to link. Um, Tom has already mentioned uh, the connections that the Australasians clerk, clerks have had in, during the COVID-19 period, and it's been very beneficial uh, to everyone. My question for the panel uh, is really about um, a constitutional issue, I think, that uh, that we may have. We've got uh, a provision, we've got a written constitution in Western Australia and we have a provision that provides that all votes shall be decided um, by members present. And so the question becomes whether um, that um, assumes a physical presence or some other presence. And I'd be really interested to know whether any of the panellists have had that question answered by their Solicitor General or by other legal advice. So um, that's something that I'm interested in, in, in finding out from any of the panel. Thank you, Nigel. Um, so I will now go to the panel. Uh, Jonathan seemed quite enthusiastic with the first question. So I will uh, begin with Jonathan, um, if he wants to make some responses.
Hi, Jonathan. If you want to, would you like to uh, make your first responses to the questions? Um, thank you, Jack. I'm afraid I missed virtually all of Nigel's question, but I would answer that uh, I would respond to the first two uh, in terms of bipartisanship eroding very definitely. Um, it, we all tumbled down the down the slope into um, into virtual sittings at a very high rate. There wasn't really time for a dissent. Everybody seemed to be of the same mind. We had to get out of the chamber. Uh, but uh, now things are very different. And uh, yesterday, for example, there was a uh, quite a touchy debate in Tinwald about uh, changing the scrutiny arrangements and the proposal uh, was voted down by a narrow majority. The Council of Ministers voting against the expansion of the Public Accounts Committee to deal with uh, the emergency in a different way. So yeah, I think it's already happened and the general sense of agreement is, is pretty much gone in the Isle of Man as of today. Uh, I what people are allowed to wear because we don't broadcast any images. And uh, sorry, I didn't hear Nigel's question. Nigel, if you, you could, you're open to- Hi, Jonathan. Uh, uh, Jonathan, my question was about um, uh, your virtual sittings. Um, we've got a written constitution that refers to members being uh, present um, and that all, all, um, all votes shall be decided by members being present. Um, so the president doesn't have a vote, but uh, a, a, a deliberative vote. So I'm just wondering whether um, any, you or any of the other panelists with a written constitution have um, addressed that question um, with their solicitor general or through legal advice. Uh, well, I'll answer that very quickly by saying that we don't have a written constitution and we haven't had any challenges on this point. Um, I think uh, what do you mean by present is obviously the question and if your constitution includes any notion of the exclusive cognizance of the legislature then uh, you, you might want to, to look at that and whether uh, you know who is to say what is the meaning of present in a parliamentary context. It should be up to the parliament to decide really. Thanks Jonathan. I will go to hands now. Uh, and then I'll open up for the remaining uh, panelists. Right. Uh, we can hear you. Cool, thank you. Um, firstly, to Eve's question um, about bipartisanship. Um, I think the spirit of bi bipartisanship has really uh, endured in New Zealand. It's partly a reflection of the national mood, which is um, quite tight. Um, at the moment, the opposition are finding uh, other ways to be oppositional while still supporting the lockdown measures. Um, the, um, one of the fracture lines, I guess, uh, has been that um, our business committee operates on a principle of near unanimity um, and certain government parties have been in favour of investigating um, virtual meetings of the House the opposition has uh, been very vocal about saying that they wouldn't support that. So that's been one of the barriers to a, a virtual plenary on our part. Um, but in, in general, um, of the measures that have been adopted, there's definitely uh, enduring bipartisan support. Um, in terms of Susan's question about backgrounds, um, we probably have a lower threshold of formality, partly because uh, we're, we Kiwis are pretty casual. and. Uh, Secondly, because our, uh, we're talking about select committees for us rather than um, sittings of the House. Um, we have had some rather hilarious backgrounds from uh, members and also from expert witnesses, including memorably a large stuffed fish uh, <laughs> sitting just above a witness's head. Um, we haven't passed any restrictions about that, but the speaker has issued uh, guidance uh, around his expectation that members will not include uh, party advertising or party colours, for example, in the background. Um, so um, keeping things functional in terms of this is a working meeting um, while still keeping it as parliamentary as we can under the circumstances, given that everyone is sitting in their spare bedroom just about. Um, and lastly, um, like uh, the Isle of Man, we don't have a written constitution um, but the question of physical presence is definitely one that we've considered when looking at possible models for a, a virtual meeting of the House. Um, one of the questions that came up was uh, whether in a hybrid model, 
the meeting of parliament would be the virtual meeting in which one of the participants is the house, or whether the meeting is the house in which one of the participants is a virtual uh, connection, um, both of which have very different um, constitutional ramifications. But fortunately, not something we've had to explicitly address and certainly nothing that's been um, forwarded to the Solicitor General or Attorney General. Thank you, Hans. And I will, I will leave it open to the remaining uh, three, Liam, Tom and Mohammed, if they want any additional uh, comments to those questions. Uh, Tom, I see your hand up there. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Jack. Look, uh, thank to, to Eve's question. Look, there, it, there has been a, a very bipartisan approach, uh, both in my jurisdiction and I, I'd have to say largely across Australia. But I, I just would observe that there are three elections due in Australia, one in the Northern Territory in August and one in at the ACT, my jurisdiction, in October and in Queensland in October. And I think the bipartisanship will probably... Um, not, not, not be as apparent uh, with, in, in an election footing as you would expect because um, electioneering is uh, by, by various, it's not very bipartisanship. So I'll, I'll watch that space. In terms of dress codes, uh, the, the, the main committee that has been webcasting is the, is the uh, COVID-19 Pandemic Response Committee, which has three women members. So I'll make, I'm on very dangerous territory talking about dress codes for women members. So I'll, I'll just be clear, well clear of that. But in terms of the males on the committee there, uh, the Leader of the Opposition has always worn a suit, but uh, one of the other members of the committee, uh, a younger member, doesn't wear a suit. And, and um, so, but there's no, no rules whatsoever about the backgrounds, um, entirely up to the members' discretion about where they, it depend, if they're all at home, uh, we just rely on um, the, the, their, their discretion. Uh, I, I noted Liam's comment about the, the, the wardrobe, I, I thought that was quite amusing. Um, and in terms of the last question from Nigel about the constitutional issue, we do have a constitution uh, in the ACT and we do have a clause that say, says that um, decisions of the Assembly, um, and I'll read you the exact um, uh, questions arising in a meeting shall be decided by a majority of the votes of the members present and voting. Um, and we are seeking some legal advice about that from our Solicitor General. There seems to be some indication that there is a, uh, a Commonwealth law that can be relied upon to say that um, a body may permit its members to participate in a meeting or all meetings by telephone, closed circuit television or any other means of communication. So I, I'm at this stage, uh, I'm relying on my, my interpretation of that is that they have to be present in the chamber. To, to make a decision, but I'll, I'll be, um, I'm sure I'll, I'll be happy to share that advice uh, once, it, once it's received. But yes, it's certainly an issue that some constitutions, um, I know in, in other jurisdictions in Australia, and Nigel's mentioned his, that um, it does preclude virtual meetings effectively. So that's all I've got. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. I know we do have two questions waiting from uh, two attendees, which we will get to shortly. So I will just invite Liam or Mohammed if they need any additional uh, quick remarks to those questions. Um, if not, I'm, I'm happy to move on to the remaining questions. Okay. Okay, so I have two remaining questions from Monica and Georgia. Um, I'll allow Monica to go first and then Georgia, you can ask your question. Hi, Monica. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Um, I've just got a question for Hans. You mentioned that um, you'd already considered issues of parliamentary privilege with using Zoom. I was wondering if you could just give us a, a broad sort of overview of the sort of things that you did consider and your conclusions, as well as whether any copyright issues came up. Um, <laughs> it's quite hard to uh, sum up concisely. I will say that I'm, I'm happy to continue any of these conversations afterwards, and I believe that um, the conveners will be distributing uh, panellists' email addresses afterwards. Um, in terms of uh, the conversations that we had about parliamentary privilege, it was uh, because our use case for Zoom involved um, submitters initially. Um, it was more about um, 
assuring ourselves that their submissions would be uh, covered by parliamentary privilege um, in the same way that they would uh, if they were giving their submission in the room. Um, an extension was drawn from someone giving a submission over a telephone, which is something we've done for a number of years. Um, depending on the platform that you uh, live stream on, you do assign the platform certain rights to use the content that you provide. Um, that they're generally, um, they don't claim ownership and the rights that you assign them are to allow them to um, distribute that content throughout their network. Um, it's a fairly complex field and one that I don't think any legislature has completely canvassed yet. Um, I think it's going to, to continue to evolve um, as parliaments enmesh themselves even more in um, the digital sphere. But definitely happy to uh, take this conversation offline. Thank you, Hans. And I think we will go to the final question from Georgia, and then we will start to conclude. And um, like Hans says, we will make a email uh, beyond hand to take any additional questions that may be answered fully in the session. So, uh, Georgia, I think your mic's on now. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm from New South Wales, Australia, the Legislative Assembly, and I'm particularly uh, interested in knowing if your jurisdictions have actually looked into the idea of virtual reality meetings, because I know a lot of um, corporations are now moving towards it or whether video conference and teleconference has been the main form of virtual parliament consideration. Thanks. One word answer. No, we haven't looked into that. What a great idea though. Um, and if any um, other panelists, maybe Mohammed, if you wanted uh, to add any additional comments. Anybody else? Um, <laughs> this is the final <laughs> question. <laughs> Something so, uh, that um, we, we've, <laughs> so the Parliament hasn't looked at, but um, I have because virtual reality is one of the things that sits with my team. Um, the issue, I think, is whether you would use those virtual meetings as an internal tool uh, where members could interact with each other or whether it's um, an external facing one. And if it's an external facing tool, what value does it provide? Um, I think the data intensiveness in terms of the, like the bandwidth needed to maintain something like that would be quite difficult um, in anything other than really high connectivity environments. Um, in New Zealand, that's probably not an option because of the, the broad spectrum of connectivity that our members have. Um, I know that other jurisdictions like the, the People's Majlis, for example, have made it um, a, a, a requirement that their members be in a high connectivity environment when participating remotely. Um, but I don't know that infrastructure is such that you could guarantee everyone would be able to um, take part in a virtual reality meeting. So while um, I think it's something that the world could well work towards, I don't think the infrastructure is there to support it yet. Thank you, Hans, and thank you. Um, oh, I think we have one final comment from Tom. Yeah, your hand up there. And then we'll swiftly uh, conclude the session. Just a quick comment, Jack. Um, in, in 2001, the ACT hosted the Australasian Study of Parliament Group, and it was a New Zealand politician, uh, a gentleman by the name of Maurice Williamson, who was the Minister for Information Technology at the time. And he predicted in 2001, and I quote his exact words, I'm convinced that in only a few decades from now, parliaments will neither look nor function anywhere near like it does today. Um, and his, his vision was that bricks and mortar, why have bricks and mortar if there's no need for elected representatives to assemble together to do their business? So some 20 years ago, there was a politician that was predicting what our questioner was asking, and, and that is virtually a virtual parliament. And, um, I, I remember listening to that being very skeptical in 2001 that that, that would come to pass, but um, the experience of listening across the panel makes me think that it's, it's closer than we think. Thank Excellent. you, Tom, for those remarks. And thank you, uh, Monica um, and Gabriella, for those final questions. Um, before I end the session once and for all, I'm delighted that we have now been joined on the panel by the Honourable John Ajaka, who is the President of the um, Assembly in uh, New South Wales, as well as, of course, the uh, Vice Chairperson of the CPA. So I'll allow 
uh, the Honourable Ajaka to make some closing remarks um, and then we will uh, swiftly then end the session. So uh, thank you. Well, thank you, Jack. It's, uh, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here and what an absolutely brilliant uh, session. Uh, good morning, afternoon and evening to all of you. In closing this online session, I'd like to thank participants, expert panellists and other observers for joining us for this meeting of the Commonwealth clerks and parliamentary staff. In particular, I'd like to thank the panel of experts, who I'm sure you'll agree, have provided great dialogue on the current issues facing our respective legislatures. There are parliaments all around the world adapting democratic processes to the current COVID crisis. I note that joining us today is also my colleague, the Honourable Jonathan O'Day, Speaker of the New South Wales Legislative Assembly. He's recently published an insightful article on this topic titled, Socially Distant but Democratically Together Towards a Virtual Parliament in New South Wales in Australasian Parliamentary Review. I highly recommend reading. Can I also uh, welcome uh, the President of the Western Australian Parliament, Kate? Always uh, good to hear from you. I'd sorry, like Honourable, Honourable like Jack, I'm just sorry to interject there. Just the fact that Liam, um, one of our panellists, had to uh, leave quickly. Um, so he did just say his goodbyes. Um, Liam, thank you very much. And please say your goodbyes. And thank you for all that you uh, contributed in this session. Great. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. I'd also like to thank the CPA for their excellent work and for inviting me to deliver these closing remarks today. As the CPA's Vice Chairperson, I'm proud of its commitment to the promotion of democracy and good governance throughout its membership, particularly in these very difficult times. I'd also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank the Chair of CPA for all of her time, dedication and leadership. The activities of CPA are crucial in encouraging and assisting parliaments to maintain transparent practice and procedure. To put simply, we have to work together to assist each other. Today, we've been fortunate to have heard from a variety of clerks and parliamentary staff on how different legislatures are responding to the crisis right across the Commonwealth. I'm sure many of you have been busy considering the next steps to take in your response to the pandemic. And I hope that this webinar will help to inform the discussions you'll have, as well as the decisions you will make. Speaking from my own experiences, in late March, the New South Wales Parliament was adjourned until September in a motion made by the Leader of the Government. However, the Parliament has since been recalled to sit next Tuesday on the 12th of May to consider urgent legislation. And I believe that this will also occur on a number of occasions. In this interim period, whilst the Chambers themselves may have been unable to convene, committees have remained active with the added flexibility of holding virtual meetings. One example is our Public Accountability Committee, which adopted a new inquiry into the New South Wales government's management of the COVID-19 pandemic. In closing, I'd like to point out a great resource that's been produced by the CPA in response to the current outbreak. The CPA has published a toolkit on the practical measures parliamentary staff and parliamentarians can take at this time. It's excellent reading. For further information on CPA activities, in response to the current pandemic can be found on the CPA's website and social media pages. I thank you all and hope to be meeting you in person soon when this crisis is over. And again, well done to everyone who put this seminar together. It's brilliant. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Jack. Thank you so much, Honourable Ajaka, for those very appropriate words to, to end the session. Um, and we do thank you for your attendance uh, and contribution today. Um, as I conclude the session, we will just have the final assessment poll that will pop up on your screen. Uh, so if all those in attendance don't mind just taking a few seconds just to fill that out uh, while I end the session. Um, while you're doing that, um, I want to, again, um, and echoing Honourable Jacker's words, um, extend a really big thank you to all those in attendance for taking your time to um, watch today. I hope you found it informative. Uh, but most importantly, to all our contributors today, uh, Tom, Hans, Mohammed, Jonathan and Liam, uh, Jarvis as well and Honourable Ajaka for those final remarks. Uh, we really, really do appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to share some of the experiences that you've, um, that you've been going through and we, we, we warmly thank you for that. In terms of follow-up, 
all of the resources um, and things that were referenced in the session we will be sending to all attendees in a follow-up email um, as mentioned earlier on as well some of our panelists have really kindly offered to um, share their emails so if there's any specific questions or issues you'd like to follow up with any of them or the CPA in general or if there was any questions that may not have been answered by yourself uh, in the session then please feel free to get in touch and we will endeavour to um, get them resolved. Um, finally as well uh, one final piece of news that the CPA are currently uh, working on in addition to the webinars is a, a suite of masterclass videos um, to help parliaments, parliamentarians and parliamentary staff to work remotely during this crisis uh, which is scheduled to be released in May I believe uh, so please yeah keep an eye out for that as well and any other further um, work by the CPA will be sure to uh, keep you all um, posted. So without further ado I will end the session and stop talking and let you all get back to your day, evening, mornings um, and again yeah thank you so much for, for attending and, and I hope to interact and meet with you all again um, hopefully in better circumstances in the future. Uh, so thank you and goodbye. <laughs>